Inside the Recording Studio, I am Jody Whitesides, and with me as standard practice is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing great, Jody. How about yourself? I'm feeling kind of funky and light and and all of that kind of good stuff. And the main reason is, is that I just noticed that we did something to the theme. We added yeah. something in there that started last we episode. Did. We did. Yeah. And right. maybe let's leave that open ended and uh some eagle eared <laughs> people will figure it out. Will, maybe. Yeah. Um yeah, no, we're all good. Uh, it's nothing like a little beta testing in the morning. So to get uh, us going, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, no, I'm good. How about yourself? You're you're all right. You said yes, feeling light and airy, and there's a reason for it, and I will explain it in the Friday finds. So, with that being said, let's jump right yeah. into our episode today, where we're talking about you've received tracks to mix. Now what? <gasps> Yeah, now you you get struck by fear or panic, uh, but you don't have to because we're here to help you out. Um, yeah, it, it's an interesting. This was a listener. David asked us about this, um, and the process to kind of go through because that that can be you know what what do you guys do? What what when you sit down and you have these files loaded up? Um, where do you start? Basically, yes. Where so, do you start? Yeah. So uh, where do you start, Jody? Well, the first thing that I'm going to assume when you ask me that question, and I am just being the mix engineer, is that I have just received a batch of Mm multi-tracks that have already been comped and mistakes have already been fixed in. Because if that has not happened and it was not discussed, I'm going to say it right now, that's not my job. (laughs) Right. (laughs) right. Yeah, that's a big assumption. And... But but it it isn't your job. Like you're there to mix it, right? You're not. It, it, I would hate, and it happens, you know. But you get files from somebody, and they go, "Oh yeah, uh, we sent you four vocal takes. You pick the one that you think is best." So, well, no, that's kind of like the producer's job, right? Or you as an artist, this is what. That's not what you're there to do. It's the editor's Unless job. Disgust. And yes, and the editor right. might be the producer, it might be the artist, or it's the combination of the two of them or the recording engineer with them in the studio, obviously doing those edits with them if they're not doing it themselves. So, yes, unless it's been discussed as being part of your job description in the mixing phase of things, that is not your job. And I'll just say now, that now. It's not your job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the, I, I would still, though, however, with a little bit of caution there, I would still go through and make sure that there are no excessive breaths in vocals. There's no squeaks in guitar files that shouldn't be in there. There's no, uh, oh, the drummer dropped his sticks right before downbeat, that type of thing. I mean, don't be a jerk. You know, don't send the files back and go, just take care of stuff. But, it is not your job to sort of fix and go through these. You, you're just there to mix the song, right? And assuming they've done their due diligence during tracking and, and before they send them off for you to mix, that should really be taken care of. Or if it's not, Which, it's an additional fee on your services. Yeah. And then you have to discuss that, approach the client. Look, hey, look, uh, having these issues with the files, blah, blah, blah. Is that something you want to fix before you send them over to me? I can do that for you. It's going to cost you X amount. Right. right. So, yeah. So, you, because you want, you don't want to get, I mean, one of the things that I um, have learned over the years is that the unfamiliarity with the material gives you an advantage. Because assuming that the, the artist, when it comes to mixing, they might have lived with these songs for six months or a year. They know exactly what's going on, but you have a fresh perspective on these so that you can have a different angle and you, you don't have that, what I like to call like demo-itis, right? When, when you have these mixes during writing and stuff and you're married to a certain sound and everything else sounds weird. Correct. So that's how I, I like to cherish that, right? So instead of, of spending two weeks tuning vocals or comping or anything that you you lose that advantage. So that is an important step, I think. So let's assume that all that has been done. Step one for Mr. Whitesides, what do you do? 
pull all the tracks. Hopefully they're named correctly, as we have discussed in a previous episode. That you Oh, have... dear God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling all the tracks that are hopefully properly named that they've been sent to you as uh, into your mix template, provided that you are working with one. And get everything situated where your faders are all up in a position of wherever you tend to start with them. I tend to start with my faders at the zero mark because it gives me some Mm -hmm. up and some down to go with. Sticking the files into your mix template and throwing the faders up so you can just hear what you have is the first step. Is for me is just to listen and then listening through the song without making any adjustments to kind of get a visionary vibe as to where the song belongs in musical production space. That's a good way of right. saying it esoterically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big, big word points there. Esoterically. Uh, no, I think that's, that's a really important and you can make a lot of, uh, you know, hopefully well-informed decisions at that point because you, you're getting to know the track and perhaps you knew before they sent you, look, we're looking for, we're doing this kind of track or we're doing like a 80s throwback type of thing. But that that's information that you should be discussed client, up front. Right? Yeah. But yeah, just throwing the faders up and listening to what's there. I think it is definitely step one for me as well. And um, making those decisions on... Like what is going on with this song? What's the focal point in different sections of the song can do, you know, half of the battle for you really, right? Mm-hmm. When you kind of have everything you do just listening. So um, you mentioned discussing these things with the client. That is, I've actually mentioned that in, in an older episode where Good. I I hadn't had the, the proper discussion with a client. Um, this was had some twists and turns to this project mm-hmm. and I was continuing as normal, right? Everything had been going swimmingly. Let's do the next song. And that's when I got that feedback and you go, hey, can we, uh, on the toms here, can we think a little bit more Fleetwood Mac and less Def Leppard, right? So, <laughs> uh, so I can speak for firsthand of that. It is important. And it's like, oh, that, yeah, that's not the same. That's not the vibe you had intended for the song. So, so discussion with, with a client, uh, up front is obviously really important. Yes. And and what goes hand in hand with that is is figuring out the style. And you, you briefly mentioned that in that little speech of understanding that something went wrong <laughs> with communication <laughs> on a client. So yeah, yeah. N- knowing where their vision lies and how it lines up with the vision that you're hearing in your own aspect of ear candy is a good thing to do. Once you get levels right, then step two, where, where do you tend to go? Well, that's not even levels. That's that's just the listening aspect, right? Right. But, but you're kind of pushing up faders. So, so do you then, at second pass, so to speak, do you then start moving faders when you think, assuming everything has been reasonably gain staged, that everything sounds sort of – more or less neutral when they're mm-hmm. at your, if you have your faders at Unity or whatever. Do you start immediately start moving levels? Um, do you read for automation at that point or are you just getting general moves? I'm guessing it's the latter. It's the latter. It's a general move. It's a level situation of like how loud do I feel the drums need to be in relation to the vocals and the bass and the guitars and the synthesizers and anything else that may or may not be in the track. So the more stuff there is to work with, the more things you have to think about in terms of where's the general level of everything that you're at Mm -hmm. with instruments. And obviously everything most of the time serves the vocal. If it doesn't and there isn't a vocal, then you're just serving what is the main element of interest at any given point in time. So that's a general level setting thing. And I don't really reach for the automation at that point. Right. No, I I do wholeheartedly agree that that, that's a little bit too premature to kind of get into those fine moves. You just want to kind of get a decent foundation. Mm -hmm. Uh, A few different schools of thought on this. And uh, I'm assuming, or, or I'm, I'm curious to what your perspective on it is. Do you tend to start with the vocal first and then no. sort of build everything around that? Or do you start with drums? Do you start with a certain foundation? Or, or does that change 
for you? More often than not, I am starting with the drums and the bass, the mm-hmm. the rhythmic foundation of what is going on. And I've always got this back of my mind, back burner of the stove concept of don't forget that vocals coming kind of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So I always have that in the back of my head that you're serving the vocal, but I really like to get a fine tune on the, the rhythmic foundation of what's going on with the song. And generally that's going to be the drums and the bass. That's a general thing. It's not always a hundred percent, but it's a general thing. And so that's where I tend to start. And I, and the reason also for that is, is that the low end can be, rather tricky when you've got everything going on yeah when you're concentrating on things that are the rhythm which is a little bit more spacious most of the time and the bass and how it locks in with the kick drum and everything it's a little easier for me to lock it in when i'm dealing with those two at once so that's that's my general thing now Sometimes, yeah. yes, I will start with a vocal or sometimes I start with a guitar. It just depends on the song. It depends on the focus. It's a program-dependent yeah. kind of thing. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it certainly is. But but the um, one thing you said that I, that I think was really interesting, and I try to do the same thing as well, is creating that foundation first, mm-hmm. right? And that usually is the driving force of, of drums and bass. And I would almost argue that in certain styles, it becomes even more important. Let's say that you're, you're, you're in the hip hop world or something where, where it's a lot of it is just about the beat, right? And the groove. And certainly in like EDM, something like that, where that, that low end foundation is really, really important. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps not as important when you're doing like a hardcore metal track where it's all about guitars and, and although the low end is important, but um, perhaps a little bit less so than dealing with other musical styles. But but that foundation needs to be there. So um, next step, what do you do what, when you have that? Let's say that you've got your drums and your bass and the, the low end foundation uh, what are you kind of sneaking next or what do you focus on next? Instrument wise? Yeah. Guitars. Or do you go for vocal at that point? No, I, at that point I move on to guitars, generally speaking, mm-hmm. and create the spatial relationship that they have with the rhythmic foundation. And right. then I tend to add whatever synthesizers or, or orchestration parts or, or anything else that kind of moves into that realm. And, Again, all the while thinking about that area where the vocal is going to reside is is important it's rather than yeah. starting with the vocal. Because generally speaking, if you're start, I don't know, I've started with the vocal and I feel like I don't give the music as much of a chance when I'm solely vocal, vocal oriented, if that makes any yeah. sense. And so... I prefer giving the music there that space that it's needed and knowing that the vocal is riding inside there in a pocket, so to speak, or sometimes depending on the style, it rides out front. But it's it's getting the basis of all the music that is the support structure to the vocal done so that the vocal can literally just fit right in like a glove. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's... Uh... Um, it can be problematic though when you say that you, you have to have that awareness that the vocal is going to be there. Yes. And I know some people really, really focus on the vocal first, right? But if you there's nothing more discouraging than, oh, I got all the music blended beautifully. And then you go, oh, shit, I got to fit the vocals into this as well. <laughs> right? Right. Uh, so I have to have that awareness. And, um, you know, different ways that we can do that. But but I like to also, dependent on style and, and song and things, but I like to have, I like to have the vocal present there as well uh, to kind of just bring that in so I'm not essentially listening to it as an instrumental in solo mode almost, right, mm-hmm. without the vocal. For fine-tuning things, it, it 
can be helpful just to have that nice solid foundation uh, of, of the music and then put the you know the, the the cream on top as it were the, the frosting with the vocal there everything on top so sure. uh, we kind of building that pyramid if you will right and we have building a pyramid yeah the solid foundation and, and building everything up after getting somewhat of a level within all the instruments um mm -hmm. i tend to reach for panning how about you what's your that's i'm sure that's all part of your method there as well yeah, I I actually as I'm getting levels, I'm actually throwing the pan around. So I generally yeah, have a concept of where I'm throwing an instrument so that I can hear it in relation to its spatial value, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know the, the perception of an instrument will change drastically if everything is just up the middle, right? Because not everything is fighting for the same space. So by just panning something whether it's hard left or hard right or somewhere in between, the perception of that instrument will change drastically and it may or may not have to be as loud in the mix. So by simply, you know, pulling it to the side can obviously shift focus to it. That sounds yeah. so obvious when you're saying it, but but it is a big deal, right? Yeah. It is. And the methodology for panning also, I don't subscribe to what some mixers will do. And Which that is, is, they keep everything center or hard left or hard right in terms of their pan. There is CLA. no middle ground yeah. between. A CLR. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. There's no middle ground yeah. between uh, center left and right. And for me, there is a whole lot of space that is utilizable by yeah. avoiding things of that nature. I get it from the standpoint of like, well, things go down to mono. Yeah. But if things go down to mono, you can listen to how your panning works regardless of whether it's a hard left or right and or center. So those are little things that I find different because to me, putting something slightly off to the left instead of hard left or putting something slightly off to the right or maybe some kind of skewed version of a left and right compared to hard left and right provides more interest, especially if you're moving things around at different sections of songs. So guitars in the verses might be panned at like one and 11, but in the choruses or the pre-chorus, they might move to three and nine by the chorus. They might move to uh, hard left, hard right. So it gives yeah. more sense of movement over the course of the song and provides in my mind, in my ears, more movement. How about you? Yeah. No, I agree. I, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I tend to do the same thing. Obviously, three-letter acronyms there. I know Chris Lord Algae is a big believer and adopter of that hard left, hard right, or right down the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously hard to argue with his results, right? Just imagine how successful he would be if he didn't do just that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and the truth is probably he doesn't just do that, but that that's his kind of like workflow from the beginning, I believe. But I think that is putting unnecessarily limitations on what it is that you do. Because I'm a big fan of, just like you're saying, you have guitars perhaps moving in the stereo field to create interest, even if it's just a little bit. It can make, when the guitars pop out hard left and hard right, it, it obviously widens up the song assuming it's a guitar song, right? But if it's synths or whatever happens to be, or background vocals, whatever, it adds that part of interest, but also little ear candy stuff where it's a vocal throw or it's a little percussion line or something to place those anywhere in that stereo field. To my ear, again, at least adds width and, and interest to what it is that you're listening to. I wanted to ask you, collapsing into mono, mm -hmm. is that something that you have adopted and you're actually using in your workflow when you're mixing? Do you check your mix in mono? Yes. Or not? The answer to that is okay. yes. Yes, yes, All yes. All right. I okay. do. All right. Fair enough. I probably should. Part of the reason, too, is I always think about how something is going to collapse down because you don't know what the end result is going to be heard on. That's part of the reason why I'm checking things in mono. And I have on my monitor switcher 
where I can switch between monitors, there's a, a button right on it. This is mono. <laughs> it's just really yeah. easy to flip right over, click, hit it, hear how things are going to collapse down and then click, unclick and, and be back into the stereo end of things, which yeah. is, you know, it, it's just a quick, easy check. And if something gets drastically out of whack, then I know that I need to do something about it. If it's not drastically out of whack, I don't worry about it. And with that, we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. And moving on, Chris, what is the next thing you would tackle on a mix? Now I start thinking about EQ moves and compression. And Ooh, that sounds so powerful. Isn't it, though? Yeah, I feel very powerful at this stage. Um, no, at this point when I start getting you know, my, my levels, right. I start feeling like I have a better idea of what I might need to do. Mm -hmm. And an important lesson that I had to learn, and I suspect you as well, and probably most of our listeners also was that you don't need EQ and compression on everything. It's a very easy thing. Now that we have all these wonderful tools say, like, okay, well, I better start inserting an EQ and compressor and everything. Like, Do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, did I've you got really the listen tools, to I it? might as well use them. Yeah. And um, it, it can really get you in trouble because when you listen to something and you just assume that you have to change something, um, it can make things sound very unnatural if you're making moves that you don't necessarily need to do. Mm -hmm. So now I start listening for things primarily – sort of corrective EQ for me is where I start, where if something has ringing frequencies, for example, I, I will notch those out. Um, if there isn't enough or too much in the high end or the low end, um, I will do those moves first. And then again, listen, what is going on? Uh, do I need to apply compression at something? And if so, why am I doing it? Right. So, um, that's always for, the big question, isn't it? Why, why yeah. are you doing this? Yes. And why are some of the reasons why you would use compression, Joey? Why indeed in terms of EQ and compression. Got, yeah. <laughs> because I got all these plugins and I want to use them. Uh, yes. Cause there's so many tools. There's so much fun to use. Uh, yeah. So essentially, the answer to that question is, if something is feeling out of whack, or I feel like its spatial relationship is not sitting correctly, that's when, when I'm going to When you say start. spatial relationship, what, what, what do you mean? Well, compression can help bring up the space of an item. Mm-hmm mainly because you're raising a noise floor and you're, and you're lowering the supposed amount of actual peak volume going out. Depending on how you use that compression, you can change the quality of the spatial relationship with what is happening between instruments and whether an instrument needs to be its own space or a part of a group space also determines how I'm going to use the compression. And it's the same sort of thing when you're going for like Let's, as I said, starting off with drums and bass, there's a lot going on in the low end. And until I actually had a subwoofer to really hear what was going on well below what my speakers can tend to put out by themselves, there's a lot of things that were messy down there. And I'm willing yeah. to bet there's a lot of people out there learning to mix that aren't using a sub that don't have speakers that go down extremely low that obviously can't hear that mess. And that mess can create issues in your mix and create problems mm -hmm. for mastering engineers and other people on the far end if it's not caught. So I'm using that EQ and the compression to balance those things out when needed and to correct, as you were mentioning as well, moves in areas where most people aren't paying attention. And it's not about a good way of saying this is not about being a perfectionist in this situation. It's about not being lazy and not being okay. unaware. That's what I would say. It's right. not, it's not about being lazy and it's not about being unaware of everything going on in the audio spectrum. So. 
So you're talking about now moves like, you know, if you have a group of instruments, also that there's necessarily not a lot of information going on in the low end mm -hmm. or the high end for that matter. Yep. But you might apply a filter at that point to kind of, let's say that you have, you know, a, a melody guitar part. You know, there might not be a whole lot of stuff going on under 100 hertz, or maybe up to 150. So you might add like a filter there to kind of cut that out just to give some extra space, even if it's not necessarily present in the signal, but it's like it could be, you mentioned like it could be a room rumble or something that's going on there. Is that is that what you're kind of talking about here? Or yes. are you just carving it? Yeah, okay. So yeah, essentially each instrument, each vocal each part is getting its space. And if there's more to that space that's not needed, I wipe mm -hmm. it, so to speak, using some EQ moves. Okay, now you're, you're talking you're talking frequency space now. You're yeah, not frequency talking space. Physical space as in right. a room, yeah. Mm -hmm. For the EQ portion. Okay. For the compression right. portion, that's actually bringing up physical space, depending yeah. on how that space was recorded and what is in there. So the moves are dependent. Some are sweetening. Some are corrective. The idea here with the compression is not just to tame dynamic range. It's to actually help paint the picture of okay. what's going on in the song. So I guess my viewpoint on compression has changed over time. Because originally it was all about taming, 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 and squashing sure. and bringing things up. But now it's not so much as a taming function as it is a paintbrush stroke, so to speak. Ooh, how eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know, but I know what you mean. Now, if you, somebody is listening to that and they're thinking, well, all I'm using is like software instruments and things. Mm -hmm. Those things that you're talking about can be a little bit less of an issue, but you're talking about primarily, if I understand you correctly, um, things that have been recorded in a physical space mm -hmm. with a microphone. When you get some of that space in the recording, like yeah. let's say that if you have a cellist or something and you're, you're probably not you know, five inches of the neck with a microphone when you're recording a cello, you probably are going to get some of that room because that's the, that's how we associate a sound with a cello, right? Sure. So if you start compressing that, you're going to get more of that, that space in your recording. Is, am I getting that right? Kind of what you're yeah. talking about now with, yeah, yeah, with the effect. Yeah. Okay. Well, and the other thing too well, is, is sometimes you get tracks that have been recorded in two different spots for yeah. the same instrument. And now mm -hmm. you've got an additional Ooh. problem of how do I fix this so that it doesn't sound disjointed? So yeah. that's a whole other issue that you need to bring up with the client because technically it shouldn't be your job. But obviously you want things to sound cohesive unless the client's literally like, no, I don't care. I want that to be disjointed. Well, then you don't have to worry about it. However, when it's disjointed, there are things that you can do to remove – as much of the sound of the extraneous room as you can, and then hopefully match the sound with what is the desired spatial value. Right. So, but that gets into a whole different area, and we probably shouldn't delve too much further into that on this. Yeah, no, we could probably be talking an hour about just that, right? But yeah. Right. But um, to answer your so, question about the compression, it's it, when I mentioned painting it as a paint stroke or using it as a paint stroke, it's it's more of an effect than it is like squashing dynamic range. Yeah. I think you're going to agree with me on this, but once you get your your EQ moves and your compression moves and your levels and now pans, you've done a lot of the heavy lifting on your mix. Yes. Agree or disagree? Arnold right. Schwarzenegger says yes. Yeah. Um, and that, that really 
to me, again, I, I, I think we mentioned this in, in older episodes, but how EQ and compression is sort of like when you're starting out, at least for me, and I think probably for you as well, but those are sort of unsexy plugins to use comparatively to like a delay or a reverb or something like that because that's a little bit easier to hear initially you hear oh they hear this big echo on something or there's this big giant space but i think getting really comfortable with, with eq and compression is a lot more important initially because you can do so much with that and that should be your your first call to action, I think, when you're starting with a mix. And only, again, if the tracks need it, right? And I think that is is a really important distinction to once again make. Don't go in and start carving out stuff just because you said, oh, this stupid Swedish guy on the podcast, he said you should remove everything below 100, right? Oh, come uh, on. Don't give yourself that little credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. well, no, but I mean, but you have to know why you're doing something. Yes. And um, look, taking all those things into consideration, also not listening to something in solo too much when you're doing this. If you are correcting something, that you might have to do that. But don't listen to, you know, the, uh, the bass guitar and assume it's in solo and you're going to have to, you know, dial it in so that it sounds really, really good by itself. Now it should work in the mix, right? <clears throat> Doesn't always work that way. So um, listen to it or making these adjustments in context, I think it is really important as well. Mm -hmm. So let's assume now that we've gotten to the point of the EQ and the compression, the panning and the levels is all there. You would do what next? I would think of uh, spatial effects. Like reverbs and delays, where do I hear that kind of thing happening? Does it need anything? But but now I start applying what I like to consider as like the cosmetics of the mix, right? I'm using that as pretty broad strokes here because sometimes, you know, obviously we've talked about use of delay and things, that that can be an integral part of the sound. Sure. Uh, where it's a, it's a big part. So it's not always in sort of like a cosmetic type of a vibe, but now I start applying those things. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to make choices about reverbs and delays if they're needed, anything like that. What about you? You know, I'm, I'm generally applying spatial things at the same time that I'm doing the EQ and compression. Because to me, they kind of go hand in hand. And that's why I mentioned you're painting space or using a paintbrush on the compression. Mm -hmm. Because it affects how the space actually works. So once I, so I feel like I've I've integrated that into the previous step that you're talking about. And at this point, I'm talking more about esoteric effects that I mm -hmm. would be using rather than the reverbs at this point. Because the reverbs are kind of integral to the spatial relationship of things. So for that, that for you is one big process when you kind of do that. You're already introducing yes. reverbs and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Yeah, and, and oftentimes, especially with vocals, and I think we've mentioned this in the vocal production episode, I will mix reverbs of varying yes. sizes to create unique spaces in and of themselves mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than just relying on one individual reverb. So, yeah, so that becomes part of that whole process with the EQ and compression. But as far as, like, once that's gone, now I'm doing esoteric effects, whether it's some crazy thing from Eventide or if it's some third-party manufacturer who's created a crazy distortion or, or crumbly effect or some kind of weird panning, bouncing, delay, chorusing, bizarro thing. That's, that's kind of the final layer into what I'm talking about Yeah, in the process. Okay, so now um, this is something that you and I, let's use the word disagree on, or at least okay. have different um, approaches to. Um, you don't necessarily like to have stuff or any kind of processing on your two bus. Although Correct. I know you do in some of your writing uh, or um, routing, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I do. Mm -hmm. Now I have those if you've been paying attention to the Two Minute Tuesdays, I have 
those already in my mix template. So they are there um, already. So I, I like to mix into them because I know those are things that I, I'd like to do regardless, but, but they will be adjusted. But once you get to this stage, when you start having a pretty good picture of where your, your mix is heading or where you're, you're ending up, mm-hmm. are you now adding any kind of processing on your, on your two bus or any part in your routing? Cause I know you got like your music and your, Yes. Your vocal bus separate. Yeah. So where I split things down between the music and the vocals before Mm -hmm. it hits the quote unquote two bus because of the crazy routings that I do, there will be some sort of compression or limiting on the music end of things. There will be some compression on the vocal end of things. And on occasion, there will be some sort of EQ after that on the music end of things, just in case I need to carve out a little more space to have the vocals sit a little better against the music. I I might do a little master EQ on that master music bus, so to speak. And where do you usually do that frequency-wise? For most vocals, the area is right around the 2K mark. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you're just pulling a little bit out, maybe one, 1. 1.5 to 2 dB max. And if you're using a mid-side type thing, from the middle. Yeah. You know, because so that's that generally sides where from, your lead vocal would be, obviously. Right, yeah. and, and leaving the sides uh, as is, but chiring it out for the center so that the, the middle gives that room for the vocal. Yeah. Now we have general level set, panning is set. EQ compression, esoteric effects, spatial effects. What's last step? Fine tuning all the automation. Yeah. And at what point do you start doing automation moves or or making automation moves in your DAW? Is it once everything is kind of there or is that sort of going on through the process? More often than not, it's it's after all of what you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. But I sometimes agree. it happens in the middle of the workflow. Like if there is extraneous noise on a guitar part or an instrument of some sort that's farting or there's odd noise that doesn't belong there, I will do an automation mute or a volume ride of some sort almost immediately. If there is an issue with levels being really far out of whack, I will do an automation ride as I'm doing the levels to make sure that they stay relatively close to where they need to be. Right. Yeah. Interesting that you bring up, you would do a volume ride or an automation ride if there's noises, because I tend to be a little bit more heavy handed. Yeah. I can do a mute, but Volume rides right. depending on what's happening. Right. No, because, yeah. So, but now are you talking about during the performance or are you talking about in between lines? Because I tend to be really heavy handed with that. If there's, you know, let's say, again, it, it's, you know, a guitar player moving their hands across the fret before a take or something, I will hard edit that out. Sure. But, but you say, but you, you would more often than not go for, a mute automation type of thing or? Well, either using the mute function or a volume ride or maybe a de for what you're talking about so that the, the live aspect of it is still there if it's needed, but just not quite so in my face or in my ear kind yeah. of thing. So yeah. no, I'm, I don't yeah, I'm like to about... strip all the humanity out of it unless it's necessary. Oh, I don't like any humanity in any of my music. <laughs> well, you're a Swede, so what do you know? <laughs> yeah. The distinction I draw there is whether it's not necessarily like a human error or if it's it's just noise. It's somebody mm-hmm. trying to, you know, keep the strings quiet, but before they take, they lift their fingers off and your strings go boink, that, that kind of thing. I, I, I would get rid of that as opposed to thinking of that as being part of the performance or, or making a human. But that's just me. It depends on what kind of track it is, obviously, and all this sure. kind of stuff. But yep, yep. And with that, why don't we move into Friday Finds? And Chris, what you got? 
I got something from Eventide that um, I, every time I use their stuff, I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> but I had, I was doing, I was recording a, a project, a big project for, for somebody here where I was tracking guitars and, and bass. And there was one track where I had a reference track when the client goes, look, I want something. I want it to kind of sound like the demo guitar. And I kind of recognize that sound, at least in the ballpark. I go, ah, I know that sound. That's crystals from Eventide. So I could give them very, very much in the ballpark um, sound of that. So every time those from like the H9, that, that kind of sweet, the Eventide stuff. But but in this case, it was crystals by Eventide. Mm. And it's just like, oh my God, every time I pull that up, it's just, or anything from that is just ridiculous. It just puts a big <laughs> smile on my face. Sweet. So, yeah. So what about you? Today, I'm going with something that is... Music related, but not music. I'm going with comfort in the studio. Yeah. And that comfort comes from my feet. And my feet are very happy because they've just found a pair of shoes where you have may or may not heard about them. They're called Allbirds. Okay. And if you've heard about Allbirds, you've heard a lot of hype about Allbirds. The hype is real. <laughs> That's all, right. all I can say. Okay. The is real. And I highly recommend them. They're super comfortable and they're insanely light. So Allbirds is my choice of this week for comfort in the studio. And that's why you feel light on your feet today. Exactly. Tying all it all right. back to the very beginning. So I stick the landing. You did it. You <laughs> did. You did. So while we've got your attention, we would like to ask you to go to the website to leave us a review. And the particular page is inside the recordingstudio.com forward slash review. And as an extra special little note, if you do it on the link that says Pod Chaser, Pod Chaser will actually donate 25 cents to the charity Meals on Wheels. So if you do that, let us know, like email us and let us know you've done that. And then we can go and respond and they'll donate an additional 25 cents to Meals on Wheels, which is pretty cool, I think. In addition to that, if you go to the website inside the recordingstudio.com, you can sign up for our email list. You'll get weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips and we'll make sure that you don't miss any future episodes of what Chris and I are yabbling about. Plus, if you're on the email list, when we do giveaways, you're automatically enrolled for the giveaway. How cool is that? And if you send us an email to goldstar at inside the recording studio.com with the word mixer, you will likely get something very cool back in your inbox. Very if cool. you have a topic of suggestion for Chris and I to talk about in a future episode, like today's topic, which was suggested by listener David, contact us at our contact page and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. And with that, I'm going to say, see you next week. Have a good one, Jody.